Hello, everybody. How are you? And welcome to Spiritually Raw. And as always, thank you so much for your energy exchange with us today. And we hope you woke to the most miracle morning and are also having the most fortunate day today. So that young lady over there, Bryce Watson, yes, you know her. I'm sure you do. And if you don't, all of her links will be in the description below. She is the host and has a channel on YouTube called Esoteric Atlanta. And we will find out more about Bryce. We're going to learn about Bryce here together, right? So this is going to be pretty cool. <laughs> And uh, she was very gracious enough to interview myself in April on her friend. show. So it's really nice to have you back, Bryce. Thank you very much. It's good to reconnect with you. Absolutely. Yeah. It's so fun because I feel like everybody I, fil I film with, I become friends with. And so when we start filming, it's like, oh, yeah, we've been chatting for a while now. So <laughs> yeah, like it is, it, you know, it's it's um funny you say that because um you really do get to know people when you interview them. And even though it's you, you'd be surprised what you learn in a very short amount of time. And then there's just that automatic soul connection to begin with. So, you know, it's like family. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 I, and I think it's like that whole, like, uh, you know, cause you're not face to face. So everybody can be a little bit more relaxed. Yeah. <laughs> you know I mean, it's like, boom, you know, you, you get these things out there, but, uh, anyway, enough about us, everybody, we're going to learn about Bryce here, but uh, I do want to uh, thank you everybody for hanging out with us. As you always do. Remember, you can watch this episode in its entirety at spiritually live and also on Roku TV. And for those of you that have not yet connected with us on Telegram, please do so. All of our links are in the show description. And um, from wherever you're watching the show, from whatever channel, wherever you are, please take one quick second, hit the like, hit the subscribe, and all of us would greatly appreciate it if you would share the show. So, Miss Bryce, welcome to the show. It is so great to have you on today. And, um, you know, I... Your your YouTube is so interesting, the name Esoteric Atlanta. How did that all begin? What brought all that on? Well, it's, it's honestly, it's so funny how spirit works, how the universe works. And I'm a pretty weird kid. <laughs> I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm one of those weirdos that always was very interested in spirituality. I could always see spirits. I was always... You know, I grew up in a very, um, as we were saying off camera, everyone in my family is a doctor, a, a very traditional Southern family. Um, I am the, uh, as I was saying, our friend Shanti from Aquarius Rising Africa, she doesn't, she says we're not, we're not black sheep of the family, we're sparkly sheep. So I, I, was, I was the sparkly sheep. I agree. <laughs> right? I, I love it too. And, um, you know, I, I uh, had always been interested in kind of the esoteric, the mysterious side of life. I laugh that one of the, the the most fun things about being from the South is the deep South is that even though this is the Bible belt, there's a lot of magic in the South, uh, a lot of voodoo and hoodoo and ghost stories. Mm -hmm. So I grew up, even though we went to church every Sunday, first Presbyterian church, I grew up hearing ghost stories and knowing about this other magical side of life too. And I ended up in India, which we spoke about on my show. My, my subscribers know I, I ended up in India in my early thirties. Um, just looking really as a seeker. I've always just been a seeker. You know, I, I remember growing up and they'd be like, you have to have a five-year plan. I'd be like, what five-year plan? Like, I don't even know why we're here. You know, <laughs> like, like, what are you talking about? So, um, which, which my, my time in India really saved me and really taught me a different perspective on life, which is that Eastern philosophy of you're just the observer. You're just the witness. The body is the Shakti of the soul. It's all temporary. And so you kind of lean into that suffering in order to kind of come out the other side a little bit more liberated. And I ended up going to a yoga school, a shala in India called KPJYI, which is one of the top yoga shalas in India. How, how long was your stay in India? Many years, back and forth for many years. It's like an actual like uni yoga university. Wow. Except for when you go, you don't know. Like I always tell people, don't go with the plan of being unauthorized teacher because that's not how it works. You guys know you've been in India. They have their own rules with how they... Yes. They live life and um, everything. And, right. yeah, but everything. <laughs> so you go just to be a student. You go just to soak in. And so that's what I was doing. Uh, of course, I wasn't married, don't have children. So I had the flex, although a lot of people do go and bring their kids with them. That is, that happens too. Um, and I ended up being authorized to teach and I ended up being the only female in the state of, of Georgia authorized to teach this style of yoga. 
And I, uh, right before lockdown happened, I had gone and opened up my own program in the suburbs. So I was driving from the city center to the suburbs. We practiced early in the morning. So I would leave at like 3.30, 4 in the morning for Brahma Mortha. And I would be done with my day at like 9 a.m. And my program was growing. And then all of a sudden, I, I kind of had been thinking about doing a YouTube channel, but it was never supposed to be like a truther channel, even though I was already a, kind of awake to what was going on. And I knew about, I'll just say the military back channel for, because I don't know what censorship is like on other platforms, but I knew about all this stuff that was going on with Mr. T, with Trump, all that. I kind of was paying attention to that. And um, then all of a sudden lockdown happened and I had started my program at a new yoga studio. So the, the studio could not, sustain lockdown and so at that point here I was I was like okay I wanted to open a YouTube channel up anyway and talk about like not necessarily conspiracies but like ghost stories in Georgia like talk about the Georgia Guidestone that was one of my first episodes mm -hmm. like isn't this weird look at this this monstrosity I've been out there multiple times I was actually there seven days before the thing came down you know just weird stuff like that and um when lockdown happened, you know, I could have just sat around and had this like, woe is me moment. Like here I am. I just became the only female authorized in the state of Georgia. And now my program's gone. But no, I just shifted everything and started working the YouTube. And it turned into me as things got so obvious mm -hmm. as what was happening. Everything on my channel kind of shifted. And so I held on to the research I was doing with all these crazy stories like the black eyed kids, because then I started realizing where where do these legends come from? Mm -hmm. Like, where do these th there, where there's smoke, there has to be fire. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of turned my channel into like, we're going to look at some of these weird folklores and conspiracies and we're going to compare it against the narrative of what we're learning now that nothing is really as we think it is. Right. And so that's kind of led me where I am today. And I've been able on my channel now that it's been three years to incorporate a lot of the yoga into my channel and talk a lot about the Eastern philosophy. You know, so I have different videos on my channel. I have the research videos and then I have like more of the spiritual videos. Um, I started going through all the missing books of the Bible, which hello, like, whoa, that was a huge wake up call to actually see what their real story is compared to what they sold us. They peddled us in church, mm -hmm. you know? And so, so yeah, it's, it's, you just never know what, what the universe has in store for you. So whenever there's a plot twist in your life, it doesn't mean it's bad. It just means that there's a, there's a shift. Yeah. Do you what, go ahead? What was, um, if you had to pick one thing that really shook your world and turned it upside down that you learned in India, what would you say that is? I think the biggest thing that really got to me over the, the period of time I was there, the theory that caused me huge ego deaths and caused a lot of suffering before I was liberated was the idea of Prakriti and Purusha, meaning that you have the body, the physical body, which is Prakriti, which is nature, the Shakti, and Purusha, which is like the soul, the eternal soul. And that Patanjali says in his sutras that man's suffering comes from the fact that man confuses who he really is with his temporary experience mm -hmm. in this life. And that rocked my world because, you know, as Bryce, you know, my name is my mother's maiden name. That's big in the South. I come from the Bryce family. They're all freaking doctors. The University of South Carolina, the football stadium is the Williams Bryce Stadium. You know, so there's a lot of like what we call ego, false sense of self. And, and yes, that's something you should be proud of that. If that's your family, be proud of the work they've done. But it's not really who you are. Mm -hmm. And so then when you start to learn that, you go, well, okay, well, then who am I really? What is my soul really? If Bryce, who is a 40-year-old white girl from Georgia, is just a temporary experience and not real, then what is real? Mm -hmm. And um, in Sri Swami Satichananda's commentary, he says the minute you really start to understand that, you can actually enjoy life. You don't take life so seriously. That is very when true. You, when you look at yes. it from the context that you just described, that if Bryce, a 40-year-old white lady, if female is just having this experience, you know, then, you know, what is real in your, you know, comparatively speaking there. So then all of what we have gone through over the last couple of years, right? Um, how did you, how do you now, if you take a look at it from a, how do you perceive it all? 
You know what I mean? I know there's judgment a lot of it. Like, oh, yeah, we've been hoodwinked or no, this is the real yeah. deal. Or this. How do you as Bryce look at it all? Do you do you look at it in a sense of, you know, let's let this shit play out? You know what I mean? It is what it is. Or is there something to anything or is it just part of existence? Like, how do you how are you perceiving it? That's a really good question. And I don't actually know the answer to is there a purpose? I mean, I, I don't think, you know, we, why, like you said on my show, like, really, why are we here? None of us really know. There's kind of multifaceted answer to that. So we, we use, so in the practice of yoga, like the Ashtanga practice, the traditional yoga practice is a very um, intense practice. It's like leg behind the head, catch, I mean, very hard on your body. And so what, so I'm just kind of using this as an example. So what the practice does is it takes the, th the thing that isn't really real and exhaust it mm -hmm. right and to the point where you have to really face triggers come up. Your, you know, your body is really just this GPS system of things you have to learn, right? And so if we look at the overall experience of, of the macro of collectively what's happening on our timeline, you know, there's a reason why we're all here right now. And law of one says that it's your soul decided to come down to refine itself. So we see all the that we call it fr friction, friction is necessary. So all this stuff we're experiencing in the greater world can also be looked at in the yoga practice, the sweat, the friction, the, the that's the suffering, the pain, because that emotion, that real raw emotion is what triggers vulnerability and truth, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so in a lot of ways, what we're seeing with like the controllers and everything, even though it's awful and terrible, it's really an opportunity for us as individuals to look inside of ourselves. I hope like, like uh, I had Sean Stone on my show show once and he's really into Eastern philosophy too. And he, he, he made a really good point by everything in the macro is just a reflection of our micro. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if we don't heal ourselves, if we don't work on our own at what what the yoga sutras would call our attachment so anytime there's a wound jealousy abandonment betrayal all that kind of stuff it's an attachment yep. to a false sense of self mm -hmm. and as long as we are attached to a false sense of self then we are not aligned with um what uh Ishvada, which would be like god whatever you want to call higher con Ishvada is the word they use in the yoga sutras god basically we're, we're misaligned and so like i tell on my i struggle heavily with anxiety and so i've used myself as the example like my anxiety whenever i have anxiety rear its ugly head that's a way for me instead of holding on to that and identifying as that anxiety i learn to be the witness of it and go up oh, again as Ram Das would say, interesting. Okay, all right, interesting. I why now am I not trusting God? Because that's what anxiety is: is you're not trusting. You've lost trust with your own alignment. Mm -hmm. You're um uh, when you take a look at then the concept of good and evil, dark and dark and white. I mean, is it? Do you look at it from a necessary thing? Like it's all good. Um, it's all an experience or is it like, you know, like, again, you hear like stuff like, Hey, we won, we won. What did we win? Um, you know, or is it, or is it, um, or, or did we win something? I mean, I know that we've talked about this a bit on your show, but for people that are watching, you know, you here for the first time here with us, uh, if you could share your views on that, your, your, your perception, your concept of, you know, good versus evil, dark and light. So we are on a planet of polarity. Um, and that is what is what an opposing force is. So we're on a planet and experience of having opposing forces. And so if we look at like, that's one thing I really love about the yoga sutras is Patanjali is really just a scientist. Like if you read the sutras without the commentary, it's literally him just writing down what he's observing in humans, which is kind of sad that we're still struggling with this 5,000 years later, we're still we're still in that same karmic loop. But so in that in that respect, we need the opposing force to create the friction, to create the change that's nest the 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 as I you know, if you are in a situation in your life where everything is just happening perfectly every single day, there's no struggle, you have no suffering, nothing bad has ever happened to you, you've just been, you would never evolve and change. So with the experience of polarity, we gain a uh, humility. We also gain wisdom and that's the soul's wisdom, the soul's wisdom. It's like I, I compare it a lot. You know, there are people I've known in my life who have just been through hell and back like they've gone through 
just so much crap. And those people I know are the most grounded, most compassionate, non-judgmental people. And that and that's what that is the beauty. You are everybody on the earth right now. And if you look at the law of one and compare it as well with, with the Yoga Sutras, the law of one very clearly states that earth is the hardest third density planet to live on yeah. that like yeah. we take the darkness to a whole different level but because we're on a planet of polarity because there is this much darkness there also has to be that much light so we're also in one of the most beautiful planets and that is and so the souls on earth it's like your soul is in, in the harvard of soul schools by For being sure. on <laughs> earth because holy crap, you know, the, the crap that we, I mean, other planets are like, I always laugh. It's like if the aliens float by earth, they like lock their doors because when we're in the neighborhood. They got to lock their doors. We're in the hood. Yeah, we're in the hood. <laughs> we're in the hood. Is. I love it. Oh my gosh. That is so funny. So I, I wanna, you know, for people watching, like give yourself grace, you know, at the end of the day, my, my algebra teacher in high school used to say this and I still remember it. Nobody gets out of this world alive. None of us are going to get out of this world alive, whether we're living to 80 or 400 or we're all this, this too shall pass. And so the fact that you're here right now means that your soul can handle it and you signed up for it. You know, I want to ask you a question about that. Um, what is your viewpoint on, um, cause you hear, you know, obviously the, all the stuff with the children you heard about tragic moved, everybody touched everyone's heart. But there's a uh, one side of the table that will say they didn't deserve that. And then there's the other side that is like, well, did they come into this realm knowing that experience was going to occur? I think both both statements are true. Both things get to be true. I, um, you know, again, the law of one laughs that when we are going to make, you know, when you go to college, university, you make your ski, you're working with your advisors, same thing when we're souls and as souls from what they say, when we're looking at our lives, especially on a planet like earth, we see it as so fast. Like this is such a, a fast experience that we try to cram in so many experiences, opportunities that sometimes our advisors have to be like, you know what? We got to pull some things off this list. List, it's too much. So yes, I do believe that that sad as it is, and as heart wrenching as it is, we do agree to certain to play certain roles for our own soul's growth. But here's the flip side to that: we also, with that being said, it is our duty as people who haven't experienced that to fight back in this experience to create that change, right? So so even though this is a maybe a preordained existence, we still, our duty and our experience as being these people right now have to go and protest and try to end it, if that makes sense. It's like, I, I say like in India, I, I have a foundation in India, a nonprofit where we work with slum kids. And we started doing this long before um, I was even aware of, I didn't realize trafficking was big as a problem as it actually is when I started oh, this. I was just focused on these poor children. And the biggest issue I had with the Indian culture, which I love, I love India, was that a lot of the up, more upper caste people would kind of just say, well, that's their, that's their karma. Uh -huh. And I would be like, but isn't it your karma to do something about it? Like you're in the position, you know, to whom much is given, much is expected. Isn't that your lesson to actually try to help? Is it though? That's a good, very good point. The qu question ultimately is, is it their lesson or have they transcended that to a whole other level of consciousness? You mean like let them experience it? Yeah. I think, well, that's where the witness comes in because I think what, what we as human beings were given this nervous system, we're given this, these emotions, which emotional understanding is how our, our soul evolves anyway. You know, psychopaths don't really have that, um, you know, and so therein lies the big, the big, uh, the big experiment, the big experience is so say you're someone like the three of us who have been very fortunate to not live. I mean, that's the, listen, 
the best thing that happened to me as as Bryce was standing in the middle of those slums and realizing I remember the first time I was in the slums and I thought well I'm an asshole because these people have literally don't have a pot to piss in and here right. I am complaining that I don't have the newest iPad like I'm an asshole you know so for me it humbled me to the point where I became so grateful for stuff that I had taken um, taken for granted before and the w- the way I see it is you do all you can to help without being attached to the outcome of the experience. So knowing that there are some things that are out of your control, there are some, you're not going to be able to sell, save everyone, but do what you can through your own and don't do it. Don't do stuff to help people to tout it on YouTube. Or to, you know, yeah. it has to genuinely be from the, from the bottom of your heart that you are feel it. And that's that connection, right? So another theory is that we all as souls, this is talked about in the Emerald Tablets too, that we as souls are one collective soul that are, is connected to God and that we decided in our infinite wisdom in order to grow even deeper in our knowledge, we had to experience separateness, right? So we had to shatter ourselves and become different people in different bodies to know separateness because we are actually whole and what's the biggest teacher of separateness then you look at things like poverty and wealth you know you you look at that and being able to be someone like myself who grew up in an upper middle class family in america the land of of comfort to be able to go in a slum where i don't speak the language and give food out and i'll never forget i mean so the lesson that it's not just even about them it's about me too it's about me and that 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 dichotomy of karmic experience where i can see this person who has nothing and i can't speak to them because we don't speak the same language but we are two souls in this dance together at this moment in this here now moment that will eventually pass and i'll never forget we uh so the Indian government is supposed to bring like rice because rice is a staple and some other supplies to like the slums once a month or something. And they rarely do it. And some of the, you know, it's, you know, government across the world. I, I don't want to call India out. It's across the world. world oh, government. Yeah. You know? Hey, and, you know what? Um, let me, let me get your, let me get your views on this from a, from the concept of, reincarnation if you would or having to do stuff again like maybe we're trying to learn a lesson here what do you think to the people out there that again i want to kind of get back to that light and dark thing that are saying hey we won we won or i just defeated the dark or whatever like that what is their risk to them that you know of right now if they continually denounce that other essence of god will they are they destined to repeat this cycle again and be like here i go again because i'm not understanding it or is it just as simple as that was just my experience for this part of it to just be That's a-, a good question. And it, it again, two things could be true in that statement, but I think, and actually I just got off with Catherine Edwards this morning and I've said this before, like we part of, you know, when we talk about spirituality, we get very like woo woo, very, you know, into the, the, but part of also being in a human experience is grounding. And um, I mean, Magdalene talks about this in her gospel, you have to descend in order to ascend. And when I see people, oh, we won, we won, we won. I see them going into a state of delusion. And that is not in the half or material. They talk about this as well. If you are in a state of delusion, you are not going to ascend. Your soul is stuck. And so what would probably, now with that being said, with that being said, the idea of time for us as humans is very linear. We have a beginning, a middle, an end, but our souls have no time. Our souls are, you can't kill a soul. Our souls are eternal. So the higher consciousness, God, whatever you call, the, will be like, you know what? If you didn't figure out the, this life, it's cool. We'll just do it again next life until you finally figure it out. There's no, it's like, there's no timeline. Like, you know, if you, if there's a, a lesson you have yet to learn, you'll just keep, we'll try it next life. Okay. Well, that life obviously didn't work to try to get you to see this lesson. So next life will put you on a different planet or in a different situation to see the same lesson from a different perspective that might, it's like when, you know, when, when you or you're a kid and a teacher, multiple teachers can teach the same concept, but one teacher is where it hits you. You're like, Oh yeah, I see now. 
it's kind of that way with lives too. the way I, I, I understand it is that our soul is trying to refine certain points of its knowledge. And so it's going to set up a life where it thinks maybe this is where my soul will refine this. But if it doesn't work next life, we'll try a different strategy. We'll try a different tutor. We'll try a different situation with the same type of polarity, which maybe I'll get it that next life. But yeah, and that's the danger. I think that's the danger of this because this is definitely a beyond anything in my opinion this is a spiritual awakening that's going on on planet earth right now and i think a lot of people unfortunately spirituality has been a little bit corrupted and so they don't really understand what true spirituality is and so they want to live up here in the delusional aspects instead of actually coming down and being very practical and very grounded. Mm -hmm. um, some one of my I'm not a huge Kirtan fan, but there is this guy named Krishna Das, who is one of the biggest Kirtan artists out there. And the guy looks like Ned Flanders. Like you go to his show, he looks so normal, but he is one of the most spiritually sought. And so there's a lot to be said about like grounding yourself and understanding that even though we are spiritual beings having having a human experience, we're here to have a human experience. And so don't be delusional about, oh, you know, we won, the, the, you know, the controllers are gone. No, they're not. They're still here. The polarity is still here. It's never still gone. Here. So it's not a spiritual. It's just not, not on this earth plane. But that it doesn't I can make sense. So it's like, it doesn't. Uh, very, if not ever, I, it would just, it, that's not, as you're saying, the polarity, you know, you can't have really one, at least on the earth plane, one without the other at this point you you think yeah. there's a um mm -hmm. okay so let's say for example um and thanks for this price it's great to get to know you at this this place it's that uh um so like when people like to say okay well i'm a healer or i'm a prophet does a real healer or a prophet really need to ever tell people they're a healer or a prophet first of all i, I think we're all prophets i think that we have to be very careful about um labeling someone as yeah there are people who have spiritual gifts for sure like and i think everybody has spiritual gifts but some people are more tapped in than others um and so you can go to someone for help if you need to but but also part of the spiritual path is learning to tap into your own gut into your own perception mm -hmm. your own seeing your own eyes to hear eyes your ears to hear eyes to see um as far as healers you know I think that the word, I think people, if you're, if you do practice Reiki, for example, maybe say I'm a Reiki practitioner because even healers, I was just, again, the Hathor material talks about if you're a healer and you're having a bad day and you go to do Reiki on someone, you oh. can't help but transmute that energy Absolutely. to that. Person. Yeah. Yes. And that's a responsibility that you have to take. Um, and so if you are having a really bad day and you have a client, your responsibility is to say, I can't see you today. Can we reschedule? Mm -hmm. So I think we have to understand that even people who have healing abilities, who have learned how to use them, um, are still human beings. They're not perfect. Um, they, they still have their own. Listen, the minute you don't need the friction anymore in this life is the minute you leave this life. And so if you're still in a human body, you still, still have to do. you still got stuff to learn yeah. right and and that's and that's just just how it is and that's in but as Sri, and i don't want that to scare people i mean as Sri swami used to teach Ananda says that's what makes it once you realize that that's all this is you can enjoy it you can enjoy the good the bad and the ugly you can see it for what it is you know absolutely you i mean if you're not enjoying it that's when the anxiety, the depression, the alcoholism, the drug abuse, so forth and so on. It's just going to magnify. What um, what made you choose the specific type of yoga that you are a specialist in? There's a, a Bible verse that I always laugh about because you have to be careful what you wish for. I, it's uh, asking you shall receive, seeking you shall find, knock and the door shall be opened unto you. So I had started practicing yoga um, when I was in, I was living in London, England in school at the time. And I took a yoga class and I thought yoga at that point was just for old people. No, yoga had not gotten really big in the United States at that point. It was not like a studio on every corner. So what I knew of yoga, it was like stretching for old people. But, but I remember I was, I was a runner at that point. I remember taking the class and I'm like, wow, I feel really good. And so I went to, um, I went to get a, at that point it was VHS videos. 
I did not know any yoga teachers at that point. So I got Jerry Hollowell's from the Spice Girls. She had a yoga video. <laughs> That's what I bought at like 20 years old and brought it home with me. And I was doing this video like once a week. But then as I left school and moved to Los Angeles, I, I got, I started to practice more, run a little less, practice more. And then I got interested in the philosophy. And so I started to read the different uh, yoga scripture. I had gone through like what we call a teacher training, which I would you know, if that's your experience to go through that, that's fine. I'm not a huge fan of the Yoga Alliance. I have my own opinions of that, about that now that I know more. Um, I've gone through this like teacher training where it was like more vinyasa flow, which is not traditional yoga. And I started teaching some and I was again, studying more of the philosophy. I, I studied literature in school. I love to read and research and, um, and I just kept thinking, okay, well, what we're teaching isn't matching the philosophy. Like this shit's not adding up. Hmm. What they're saying in the ancient scriptures is not what's being taught in these vinyasa flow. It's actually in direct opposition. And so I got really frustrated. And I remember saying, I'm just going to quit because there's no integrity in this. Hmm. Well, at that point is when I met my first Ashtanga teacher. I met him at another studio. He kind of walked in and I was expressing my frustration. He was like, just come and take this class. And so I did. And then I was like, oh, okay, yeah, that's actually yoga. And that matches the scriptures. And so I started traveling back and forth to Philadelphia, uh, where my original Ashtanga teacher, David Greig, was located. And so I traveled back and forth and I learned so much from him. He was such an, he had studied in India. This is what qualified me to go to India. Huh. Um, I, you know, as, as I said, Ashtanga yoga, like it is, it is a very extreme, it's it's like Cirque du Soleil, you know, on its steroids. It's, oh, it's wow. crazy. Yeah. And there's not a whole lot of, there's no yoga voice. There's no music playing. It's taught in a Mysore style where you're practicing on your own, the different series and the teacher works with people individually. And I would watch David teach people and I would observe the way he would teach. And I learned just so much from him about how to appreciate the friction because he would have these like young girls who are obviously like cheerleaders or gymnasts and they would come into the Mysore room and they could easily do a handstand. They could easily put their leg behind their head. And he, he acted like he was bored by this. <laughs> he like, oh, pastor, whatever. But if like a 60-year-old man came in the room who was overweight and couldn't touch his toes, David would get so excited because mm -hmm. he'd be like, now we have something to work with. Mm -hmm. Now there's resistance. And I would sit back and think, oh, my God, this is such an interesting perception to take. This is excitement over the obstacles, excitement, because now there's something to actually work with. Mm -hmm. And that changed my whole perception. And he used to say, those who are lucky, their karma comes up early. It comes, comes up in primary series. And now I understand it because if it comes up early, if you're struggling in primary series, amazing. You're, that's how open you are to actually receiving. Right the challenge. And so, and so then I started going back and forth to India. Um, and that's when I got authorized. And now I am strictly, obviously strictly, I had to si actually sign a contract with my school in India that I would never teach any, the only traditional yogas out there, are Ashtanga, Iyengar, and Sivananda yoga, the rest are all considered contemporary. And so I had to sign a contract saying that I would never be involved in any form of contemporary yoga because yeah, it's um, it's very. You, I have to realize too, guys, that yoga comes from you know Hinduism is a very old, one of the oldest religions in the world, and it's one of the most beautiful religions actually. And yoga is a subsection of that. Now you can practice yoga absolutely. It can be yoga transcends all religion. You can incorporate the yoga practice into any faith that you are, or not have a faith at all. Um, but for India, that's part of their culture and their heritage, and so it's very important to them that their teachers keep that respect for the practice and so that's why i try to keep hold that veneration for their them and their culture that's beautiful do you have the the buddha behind you is that uh the uh beautiful buddha do you think that uh is that the way of life do you think that's probably closest to getting it on living the way we should live in here in this buddhism is an offshoot of hinduism and it's so a lot of the, the the big principles of Hinduism are also found in Buddhism, which is the same idea of your soul just experiencing 
a um, um, a human experience at this moment. And this is Siddhartha. So this is the Indian Buddha, which there there's also a Chinese Buddha. Um, and so actually, I was just talking about this with Shanti yesterday, Siddhartha, that's a great, you can read the book of Siddhartha, Siddhartha, where he was a prince who goes out and tries to experience the exact opposite and go into complete poverty, where he in, realizes that there has to be a balance, um, which is literally, you know, it's, um, we, we know that, you know, if you, I love psychology as well. And you know that like, um, cause that's what yoga is really. It's a study of your mind, you know? Um, and in psychology, they, they say that black and white thinking is a sign of a mental disorder. So people who take extreme views on things, it's a sign of, uh, and what is a mental disorder? It's, it's an imbalance in something that's, yep. and that's the beautiful thing about the Eastern philosophy too. It's like, you're not doomed if, if you have like something wrong, we all have things wrong with us. It's just your body's way of saying, Hey, maybe let's check out your throat chakra or your root chakra. Let's see where there's an, a, a wound there that needs healing. And so, so any type of like disease, sickness, mental, that's something for you to kind of as a practitioner be like, Oh, interesting. This is something I need to look at as far as my own weaknesses. And so, um, so yeah, with the, the Buddhist faith, with the, with the, and this is all, if you're a Christian too, this can also be applied to the Christian faith as well. This is a lot, if you, especially if you read the missing books of the Bible, Yeshua, that they called Jesus, Yeshua and Magdalene taught the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, in Magdalene's gospel, she goes through uh, what we call in yoga, the kleshas, which are the obstacles of humanity, which are like the real big things that the ego has to go through. And that's all coming from yoga. Um, in some of the missing books of the Bible, Yahshua is teaching his disciples yoga because he studied in india so did magdalene and so a lot of these what we call different religions are all coming from the same central idea well it's really one of the oldest philosophies so there's got to be something to be said for that um jay is hindu oh cool <laughs> awesome. we're pretty familiar with the with the philosophy and um we're very very connected to it as well for a lot of reasons but um well, how does your family feel about that your your baptist christian family my and you know it's funny my mother my mother is is uh <laughs> She actually, you know, for a while, it kind of concerned her because she, you know, you, you, and I, I listen, I totally understand. I, I actually, out of all the religions in the world, I feel like Hinduism is the closest to the mm -hmm. truth. I know that human perception, there's always going to be a mis misrepresentation. I get that. I know. And I know not every person is, is honest and integral. Like I get that. So don't leave comments guys. Like we understand that you can't tar everyone with the same feather, but as far as the general philosophy, now a lot of the, uh, the Hindu, demons uh are very elaborate in the way they look and so i can understand from a person who's been sheltered in a christian environment they can see that as something that it's not Evil, so dark yes right. mm -hmm. and my favorite like i i talk on my channel a lot about the ramayana which hanuman is one of my favorites it's one of my favorite um uh, aspects i'll say aspects of god because i want to make that clear too is that it's all different aspects of the same mono god idea um, and I, the Ramayana, you know, Sita, who's Ram's wife, gets kidnapped by Ram, uh, Ravana, who's this ten-headed demon who can't be slain. And so Ram hires Hanuman, who's this militant monkey god, to help him find Sita. And Hanuman himself, who's the son of the, the wind, the breath, he kind of goes through amnesia where he forgets that he has these abilities, but he then remembers and... He, he, he goes to Sri Lanka where he finds Sita captive in the forest. And so, but he knows that if he takes Sita back, if he just kidnaps her back and brings it around, that this cycle is going to continue. And so he knows that he has to actually defeat Ravana in order to bring Sita truly back to Ram. And I, you know, you can read the Ramayana for yourself, guys, but he does end up defeating Ravana and he brings Sita back to Ram. Well, this story is all about you. You know, Sita is your soul. Ram is God. Ravana is your ego and Hanuman is your courage. Mm. And through the breath, through the, the wind, Vishnu, the breath, the, that holy sacred breath of pranayama, of prana, that breathe, God, in you know, the Bible says God breathed life into man and man stood up. You gather that courage and you're able to bring your soul back into alignment with God. And that's why we're all here mm -hmm. is to find that alignment back with God. And so that to me is one of my favorite stories besides also the Bhagavad Gita was very life-changing as well. Um, and so all of these Hindu stories are 
very personal and very profound. Mm -hmm. They are. So as far as getting connected to God, so there's this whole movement. We're more aware of it now of plant medicine. Mm -hmm. Your your views on that, um, as far as is it just the way we're at? And I know there's different stages of, and ages. So do you think that people, do you think everybody should be on plant medicine? <laughs> I do actually. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's so many different forms of plant medicine. You have to, you have to find what works for you. And I would definitely suggest if people are, are looking into plant medicine, find somebody who knows a lot about it. Like, uh, you know, some Ayurvedic doctors can help you, but like, I'm a huge fan of microdosing. I've been very honest about that on my channel. Um, you know, if you look at Jordan Maxwell's research, we have in the Bible and, uh, you know, all the uh, Abrahamic religions, they talk about the tree of, you know, the, the tree of life, the tree of eating from the garden of good and evil. Well, I have a different perspective on that now through my research, because I, I don't, the God of the Bible is Lucifer. So <laughs> I think, I think Adam and Eve actually awakened out of a gel state to leave what was there. But Jordan Maxwell would say that the magic mushroom is actually that tree of life. Mm. And that's what actually, that actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And, and and there's a reason why they make this stuff illegal. You know, it, there's a reason why they don't want you messing with this stuff, but yet we'll, we'll give you synthetic stuff. And so I'm a huge fan of microdosing. I microdose all the time. Um, it's, it's for my, for those who don't know what that is, it's taking such a small amount that it, you don't feel any different, but over time it helps relax certain, um, like for anxiety, for example, it will relax the anxiety enough for you to really observe it so you can work through it. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people uh, do a lot of ayahuasca. Um, I, I've never done it, but I have a lot of friends who participate and they say that's very life changing. It's pe peyote. You know, this is what a lot of people, I know a lot of people in India who do ayahuasca um, while they're there. And it, uh, you know, it, it definitely can open up. It's just got to be a crazy place to do ayahuasca. I know, right? right? <laughs> I'd be afraid to do it. I, I, would, I would totally be afraid to do that. Yeah, that would be a little I'd much. Like, oh, man. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> talk about, talk about the, all the, I mean, that's the fun thing about India is like India is so colorful and it's so loud. You use and, ayahuasca as <laughs> is. So. I know, right? It really is, isn't it? Oh, yeah. shit. You're right about that. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> wild. That's but the, minute, the thing about India too, and I, I think I said this before, like when you when you lean into the, it's a control, it's a it's an organized chaos. When you actually yes. lean into it and just accept it, mm -hmm. it works. And yes. it's and I had after my first trip to India, when I came back, I was there for four months. When I came back, I had more of a culture shock coming back to America than I did going to India. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it it does. Uh, you know, I, I think just in general, like I mean, every at least child or soon to be adult should probably visit some kind of country like that mm -hmm. just before they really start life. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I think it would be a great experience. You know what I mean? Because it's like, and, you know, if they're, if they're here, you know, like, you know, in their twenties or whatever, I mean, I don't know. I, th I think it'd be probably a pretty good thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, Get absolutely. Balance, you know what I mean? Well, the Indian people, at least the Indian people that I've become really good friends with are so loving they bring you into your home. They feed you. They're so excited about you. I mean, I have, I have really good friends that I've made in India that aren't even affiliated with the school that I've just made. Mm -hmm. And you become the part of their family. And that's one thing. Everybody's called an, an auntie. Like when there's yes. a guy that helps me get my apartment and stuff pretty deep when I'm out there. And the first time I went there, I noticed he was calling everyone auntie or, or auntie around. And I'm auntie. like, who is this? <laughs> this guy has got, he's got a lot of family. And then I realized that that's just, that's just the that, thing. That's that respect. Our dog, my dog is from India, Ravi. We, uh, we, uh, Aww. brought six dogs back so far. Um, oh. one was, yeah, the rest are, are, are in other homes. Um, and so, yeah. And that, that, nice. learning, and I love that about, you know, I'm a vegetarian myself. And so just seeing the way that the animals are, you know, although I, I'm, I'm still a little bit afraid of the cows because the cows are, yeah. can be a little bit violent. So, so I try to it, back is, cows. Is, is, is being vegetarian a choice for you or is it really an existence thing that, that we all need to do? You started your yoga practice or? No, I was 14 when I went vegetarian. I actually was having, I, I told the story with Catherine this morning when I was like, my mom's family is from Charleston. They're from the Low Country, and there's this dish called she crab soup. And as a child, when you when I would go to the Low Country to visit my mom's family, we would eat she crab soup at like every meal. It's it's like a chowder. Mm -hmm. And I remember being like five or six and being in a restaurant. And this restaurant left the crab meat in the shape of the crab. And oh. I remember 
freaking out when I saw that as a child. My mom was like, it's okay. And she starts mushing it up and I started crying even more. So that was like my first realization that I was seeing a living thing. And then I started to have really bad, uh, I'm RH negative as well. And I'm Vata. So that's just double digestion problems. And um, I started realizing every time I ate heavy meats, I would get like, I would throw up, it would make me so I just kind of at 14 just kind of stopped not even intent. It was just kind of a natural I don't even know if I knew what the word vegetarian meant at 14. You Mm -hmm. know, it was just kind of a natural and now I'm 40. And I you know, but yeah, being in India, you know, some people like, Oh, what about your protein? I'm like, listen, India, 80% of India is vegetarian, and they live to be over 100. So, you know, so yeah, they do, don't they? Do you do you eat fish or are you are you plant only? Plant, plant. Yeah. That's great. So, what did you have for breakfast? A bagel. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. You eat bread, remember? Mm-hmm. yeah, I do eat bread. You can I'm eat. Vata. Yes, I'm vata. So that's one thing too. The Ayurvedic system of medicine has helped me a lot, which is the dosha system. I've talked about that on my channel a lot. I'm vata pitta, and the minute I realized I was vata pitta. I realized that growing up, like my mother would give us like peanut butter and apples for a snack. Well, as someone who's Vata, a raw apple is going to make me sick because the apple is also Vata. And so it's too much energy. And so I have to counter that with kappa foods with the, so now I understand that system, which I think if people actually understood food medicine and food Uh. magic, Oh, it would change everything. So like I can handle sugar, I can handle breads, um, but someone who's more kappa or more pitta might not be able to. And so it depends on your disposition. If you are really pitta, which is fire, you might crave spicy foods, but spicy foods might not be the best for you because it's too much fire. You need more cooling foods. And that system like literally changed my life as well living off of the now now I totally but with that being said if you can balance your dosha you can cheat every now and again so like if you are if I'm a vata and I'm really focused on what I'm I'm eating a good diet for vatas then I can have like a juice every now and again and be okay it's just if you're doing it all the time too much like attracts like and it becomes an over an abundance of the vata energy and so that's when the anxiety gets bad that's when arthritis gets bad because vata is cerebral it's there yeah, the inflammation. Uh, what what what? Well, you look phenomenal. What do you what do you think of uh, intermittent fasting? Is that a thing that people should really be looking seriously into? You know, depends on your dosha. So I, as a vata, so this is the funny thing because I think God also has a sense of humor. So um, so if so, so a vata like me, I'm not a foodie. Most vatas are not foodie. So I'm the type of person that will just not eat if if I will forget to eat. I I've struggled in the past with with getting too underweight. Um, And that's typical for a Vata. But with Vatas as well, Vatas, typically, it's a sign from your body that you're hungry as a Vata. First thing that happens is you start to space out. Mm -hmm. By the time your stomach growls, you've gone too far. Now, Kappas, on the other hand, can go long times without very long time without food. So for me, I do believe in intermittent fasting in the sense that it gives your digestive system a break. And so for me, what I do as a Vata is I stop eating between four and five in the afternoon and I don't, then I'll go to bed and then I don't eat again until like after I've practiced in the morning. So I give my digestive system like 12 to 14 hours. Cause yeah, you go so to bed I- early and you wake, uh, you go to bed early cause you wake up very early. Yeah. So, so that's what works for me as a Vata with getting the best of both worlds. I, I set my alarm to snack during the day and then I stop at a specific time. So when I go to bed, my system, because you, you do want your, your digestive system. To oh, work. definitely at night. Yeah. Right, right, right. Or you wake up and your eyes are swollen and you don't feel good. You're sluggish. You're tired. Hell? What did I do? <laughs> Yeah, think, I mean, think about it, guys. The blood, the blood in your system, like when your digestive system is working, all the blood goes to the digestive system and doesn't go to the other organs. So, like your skin's an organ. So, yeah. if your digestion is clear, the blood's going to be clear to go and work through your other organs as well. Wow. Yeah. Um, so, we see a little blue bottle behind you. <laughs> Tell us how you're incorporating the AC into your lifestyle. I love this. I just, I feel like it fits in perfectly with the, um, with, my lifestyle specifically because you know in the yoga world or in the eastern philosophy spiritual world every frictional thing that happens health or otherwise is an opera you you have to be the person to spark that change but the asia is something that's really helping i have to tell you guys on tuesday 
we went high. I took the day off Tuesday. I got up that morning and I did a full 60 minute bar class, which is with weights and stuff. Then we went on a three and a half, four mile hike. Fine. Then I came home. We got home late and I decided to clean the bathroom. Good for you. <laughs> and I literally got in the bed that night and I was like, is that the Asia? <laughs> I was like, <laughs> it does. It gives you the sustained energy. Yeah, for yeah, me, that's I'm, great. Yeah, like, that I, is excellent. We run, and I noticed, like you know, the running is just boom. I mean, you're like, wow. Yeah, I'm like faster, Longer, stronger, further. I'm not winded. I mean, it's it's like a you know, it's a, like a it's like a new version of you starts to pop out. Mm -hmm. So right. it's it's subtle too. Like it, it was a very yeah. subtle, and so I I am so I can't wait. I vlogged this week, and I'm going to be putting it up this weekend of of my experience of everything and. I was telling Danielle that I, you know, usually by five, six o'clock in the afternoon, I'm exhausted after, I mean, you guys know, running a YouTube channel, our radio program, it's like oh, a yeah. full time research, booking stuff, editing, yes. so getting up at 3.34, practicing and working all day by five, six o'clock in the evening, I'm usually pretty shattered. Yeah, right. mm -hmm. But after like three days, I was, we were sitting in the bed watching TV and I looked at my boyfriend, I was like, am I going to have to take a Benadryl? Like, I was like... <laughs> I'm tired, <laughs> you know, and that's what's great is because I do think, you know, I do think part of the going back to the polarity, I do think what the darkness has done has put us in a, in a place where our, our human existence has been shortened and aging does come on a lot quicker than it should. And so what this has done is it's going to prolong uh, my uncle, one of my uncles who uh, passed away a few years back, he would call it, he called it QTR, quality time remaining. You know, when after people retire, it's like all of a sudden, like, what's my quality time? He would go on all these trips, but in hiking trips and biking trips while he still could, you know. And um, and so I think that's what this product is doing. It's it's enhancing your vitality. Mm -hmm. And this is something, too. You know, I've been saying on my channel a lot that so many people I feel it makes me sad. So many people, it's like they're waiting to experience happiness. Yeah. When the opposite comes or yes. when the white hats yes. win. Mm -hmm. And that's not spirituality. Spirituality is finding peace even within the darkness. And I think that this product is going to help people learn how to be alive. We're so we're so focused on death and prolonging death that we forget to be alive. That's and so I, think, true. I think a lot of that what you're just saying comes from the delusional aspect. And um, it's really throwing people's lives into a whirlwind because the carrot is being dangled and dangled and dangled. And they keep thinking, well, you know, I'll just sit back and I'll and I and I, I I'll, I'll wait for the RV or I'll wait for this uh, great uh, flash or I'll, or I'll wait for this or wait for that. And it's stunting their own growth. So it's preventing them from really um, healing themselves and, and being the best version of themselves. Are they victims in that scenario, Bryce, or are they willing participants? I think they're willing participants. I think, I think we, um, you know, I, I think we're so used to being spoon fed and that's the lesson, right? That might be why their soul decided to come here is to find. And I keep telling people like, no one's coming to save you. No one's coming to save you. But that is the best news in the whole entire world. Because if yeah. you allow someone to save you, then they have control over you. That's mm -hmm. the plot twist. Yeah. You're the white right. hats. That's the plot <laughs> yes. twist. Right, right, right. <laughs> You're the white hats. Like, it's you, boo. Like, it's all you. You know, when- You uh, are the Great Awakening. You are the Flash. You are the white hat. You're also the dark hat, too. Exactly. Well, that's what I, you know, when I was, Sean Stone and I spoke a lot about this. Because it's like, you know, if you understand- the laws of the universe, again, like attracts like. You cannot, it's like the Michael Jackson song, Man in the Mirror. You cannot, you cannot stop the controllers for doing what they're, they're doing until you heal yourself. Mm -hmm. Because it's your wounds that are keeping that going on. And not just one particular person, but collectively all of us. And so if we all sat and said, wait a minute, I'm going to put myself in spiritual quarantine. And I'm going to work and go inward and work on and find my sense of self and work on myself. Then we might see an outward change. But the, but the, the thing that the interesting thing is, is once you start changing yourself on the inside, 
your outside changes anyway. Yeah, totally. Because you start attracting better people. You, I went through in my early 30s, I went through trauma therapy. I had this, this habit of getting into like abusive relationships with narcissistic guys. And I got so bad that I ended up going into trauma therapy. It was the best thing that ever happened to me. Best thing that ever happened to me because I got to address the wound that was causing me. I was the common denominator in all these relationships. I was the common denominator. And so when I could heal that, which it went back to my childhood, after I went through that therapy, went off to India, all that kind of stuff, all of a sudden I started attracting healthy men, good men into my life. And so it's always about you. And that's the power move. You are in control, mm -hmm. not some white hat, not Trump. You're in control. That's right. Yes. That's right. Yes. I, 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 yes. I totally yes. get that. That's awesome. That's <laughs> awesome. So this has been pretty cool to hang out with you and get to learn uh, this version of Bryce and you know what your what your views are. So what do you want to be remembered for a hundred years from now? Like when everybody looks back and says, you know, hey, what'd she do? What what do you think? Oh God, I don't know. I take a lot of pride in my Magdalene, like really revitalizing Magdalene. That's something because we've gotten that story all wrong, guys. I actually though, you know, I think I think I like to laugh. I really like to laugh. And I would hope that my nieces and nephews and great nieces and nephews would remember that I was the kooky aunt <laughs> that they got to laugh with. That's what I think I would. That's what it is for you. That's cool. That's, uh, awesome. that's Bryce Watson, everybody. I hope you uh, enjoyed hanging out with her as much as we did today. And we hopefully this this relationship can continue. We get to be on her show, vice versa. We're just going to see a lot of each other as we go through this. Um, Bryce's links will be in the description below. She's got a really awesome channel and it is very, you know, it's got a lot of cool stuff and it really is relevant in in what's going on and i really believe that esoteric yeah and eclectic. um really really believe it can help you in your journey in your life also bryce's a seal link will be in here what we were spoken about it'll be in the description below so um if you're not at optimum performance mind body spirit and prosperity click on her link there that'll see a link there and there'll be a form there and, too. um i'm just gonna mention something that you had said earlier if you are a healthcare worker if you are a healer if you, I'm going to throw this in there too, a psychic, if you're anything where you're working on other people, you owe it to the people that you're working on that you have to be in your absolute peak performance of all time, especially when you're doing energy work on anyone. So uh, otherwise you're not only doing yourself a disservice, you're doing a grand disservice to the people that you think you're trying to help because it's actually backfiring. So mm -hmm. Um, it's critical, especially if you're in the energy field or the healthcare field, health work, um, any type of, uh, you know, um, health environment is to make sure that you yourself are in the highest frequency and, um, you're working in the, the, the highest energy that you can. And the ASEA helps to keep you at that high frequency. If you're in the Atlanta area, um, I know we have a lot of students at Ashtanga Yoga Atlanta that came through this my channel. Um, we once we get our 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 we're about to get the little what are they called trial size lotions? Yes, of the the Renew Twenty Eight. Yeah, we're gonna have them at the Shala for people to try it. If you're That's in the nice. Atlanta area, so you guys can come try the lotions, especially. I've been putting the lotion on my knee, and it really does make a huge difference. So, um, absolutely. So we will have That's that awesome. at, at Ashtanga Yoga Atlanta. That's great. Yeah, That's really cool of you. That's really great of you. All right, everybody. Thanks for hanging out with us as you always do. Much love to you. And we will see you next time. Yes. Thank you. And together with the beautiful Bryce, we are turning the universal key to global harmony and creating a unified world. Thank you so much for tuning in. And remember, tune in often. Tell all your friends. And most importantly, may all your beautiful dreams come true. Many blessings.